Folks, uh, my name is Charlie Kilpatrick. I'm currently president of the Ulster Grassland Society and a very warm welcome to the Society's 62nd annual conference. So this year, due to coronavirus restrictions, we're in a completely new webinar format, something new for the Society, something I haven't done before. Uh, tonight's story event is the second of two evenings presentations and it follows on from today's webinar. This evening, we have a unique international theme that will link up with New Zealand and Cheshire and England. Now, although the coronavirus panic has proven to be restrictive in so many ways, uh, this year it has given the Ulster Grasslands a great opportunity to reach out to a much wider global audience. I'm aware that some of our audience tuning in from as far away as New Zealand, Australia and Canada, and to them, a very special welcome tonight or in some cases, good morning. The theme of the conference this year is a new direction in farming. And it follows on from last year's conference theme, which is called Getting Back to Business. And that conference last year identified a real need for farmers to focus on strategic planning to address specific changes and future challenges facing our grass-based livestock sector. Now tonight, there will be two presentations each chaired the incoming president-elect Harold Johnson and myself, respectively. The first presentation is by New Zealand dairy farmer Colin Glass, linking in tonight from New Zealand. And I see his father, Derek, who hails from Northern Ireland, sitting beside him tonight. So welcome, Derek, as well. On a short break between speakers, I'm going to give a very short presentation to announce the runner of the Ulster Grassland Society Dance Bank Innovation Award. This will be followed by Cheshire dairy farmer, Arthur Fernell. Now, probably a bit of housekeeping there. Uh, Jason, you're gonna put the next slide up. Uh, in order, you're, everyone in the audience is automatically muted with their camera turned off. And in order for members of our audience to ask questions on Zoom, at the bottom of the screen, there's a question and answers bubble. Now, if you want to ask a question, click onto that and a question box will appear on your screen. At the bottom of this box, type in your question and press the enter key, and the question will appear on a list for the chairman to field after the presentation. So we want to answer the questions after, the pres after each presentation. The issues leaving and rejoining usually fixes the problem. This webinar will be recorded, so it'll be on the UGS website in days to come. And uh, when you leave the webinar or when it ends, you'll be automatically directed to the web page where you have the option to complete the survey. So without much more ado, I'm going to hand over to incoming president elect Harold Johnson, and he's going to share the first presentation. Thanks, Harold. OK, thanks, Charlie. Uh, thanks, Charlie, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, they say it's an ill wind that blows no good and the old ones of COVID have changed plenty in our lives this past year. It has, uh, however, forced us to change the format of this conference, as Charlie, our president, has said. But the silver lining is that we have been able to access renowned international speakers. So Colin, the Ulster Grassland Society is delighted and privileged that you're able to join us tonight. As some of you may well know, Colin's father's family originate from County Antrim, and emigrated to New, New Zealand in 1956. I see Colin's uh, father, Derek, is also tuned in tonight. So uh, a very big Northern Ireland welcome to you, Derek, and to the rest of the Glass family. Colin owns and operates a 650 cow dairy farm, and on two further irrigated properties, he rears and finishes bull beef at Methven in mid-Canterbury with his wife, Paula, and their two daughters. Colin is also Chief Executive of Dairy Holdings Limited, which has extensive operations throughout the South Island, and he's going to talk about that to us tonight. He's a director of several agribusiness companies and is currently chairman of Ashburton Lindhurst Irrigation Limited. Um, he's going to give us an overview of New Zealand agriculture. He's hopefully going to touch on costs of milk production and environmental issues for New Zealand farmers. So, Colin, over to you. Thank you. 
Thanks very much, Harold. And that suit me a, a privilege to, to be here. I was going to say tonight, but it's this morning our time. At the moment, we managed to get our jobs done early. And Dad was just telling me before that, uh, that today marks the anniversary of, uh, of the Glass family's arrival in New Zealand, as Harold said, back in, uh, back in 1956. So it's certainly been quite a journey for us. In fact, with the, Harold, you mentioned the challenges of COVID and uh, that's something that we can personally relate to because we're actually planning a trip back to Ireland last year. And uh, so COVID put, uh, put pay to that, but at least through this technology, we're able to catch up tonight. So thank you very much for having us. So as, uh, as Harold mentioned, uh, I'm, I'm really just going to pray, uh, pay very much a lay overview of our own farming operations at Methven, a quick overview of dairy holdings operations throughout the South Island of New Zealand, touch on some of the things in the wider New Zealand dairy industry and the trends and challenges that we're having on a number of fronts, including water quality and methane. So uh, Jason, if you'd like to flick to the next slide. So in that map of the South Island, you can see the, uh, the, red, uh, the red star uh, inland from uh, inland from Christchurch, there marks the spot close to uh, close to Methven, where our farming operations are, and that's the the farm that uh, that Dad and his brother uh, purchased in the early 1960s at Methven, and we uh, we farmed uh, together uh, through a through a family company there with uh, with Mum and Dad and Paula and I. Uh, with our uh, with our dairy farm just down the road from those um, from those first farms, this slide here provides a quick overview of those uh, of effectively what we call the home farm, the Westwood Ho farm, and then the uh, the Muckram property where Paula and I live, and Muckram's named after the the farm at Money Glass where uh, where Dad and uh, and his brothers and sisters were born and raised just uh, in uh, in County Antrim. So we've been back there a couple of times, and. Uh, where, where we live looks nothing like uh, Muckram at all, does it? Ted? But uh, there's a few there's a few centre pivots at home, and uh, and and it's all very very flat, uh, very very different to the uh, to the Muckram farm of origin. But um, but the, uh, the 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 farms at Methven are uh, are pretty simple by New Zealand standards. We've uh, on on three hundred and ten hectares, four centre pivots. And it's uh, it's unique in that it's a bull beef operation. So the bull calves come from three farms. Uh, one is our dairy farm, and then there's two other farms at Methven in close proximity. And we try and keep that uh, the source of bull calves to that farm relatively tight. And that's principally for biosecurity reasons. M. bovis or Mycoplasma bovis has been a real plight on the New Zealand dairy industry for the last couple of years, and we're we're making quite good headway through an eradication program, and I'll touch on that shortly. But the biosecurity piece is very important for our farming operation because that enables us to sell those 400 bulls each year into the dairy industry as service bulls following AI. Uh, and then, of course, because New Zealand's very seasonal calving, the, uh, the mating season starts at the end of October, and so most of those bulls go off our property uh, in early November and uh, well, basically through the month of November to uh, dairy farms around Canterbury. The bulls that aren't selected to, uh, to have a short uh, journey of paradise before they meet their maker, uh, they stay on our property into the autumn when they're slaughtered. And we average around about 300 kilograms carcass weight with those bulls being at about two, two and a half years of age. Um, this uh, shot here just shows the uh, the home farm, so the Westwood Ho and the Muckram property. You'll see the Mount Hutt in the background for those of you that are familiar with Canterbury. And so we're looking right up into the Mount Hutt Basin. And uh, that's just a, a typical shot of uh, of Frisian yearling bulls. Sort of, uh, so those bulls will be going out, uh, out to service the dairy industry in this upcoming November period. And then just a couple of shots of the uh, of, of the homesteads on both uh, on both farms. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jason. So the uh, the Tamlet Dairy Farm again, uh, another Northern Ireland name uh, from uh, from Tamlet Rishakin, 
where um, my grandfather, dad's father was from. And uh, so this, this dairy farm is within a stone's throw of the two other properties. This is where uh, we run what has been this year with the milking 670 crossbred cows or in New Zealand, we call them Kiwi cross cows. So that's a Frisian Jersey cross. And uh, if anything, that's it's erring a little bit towards the uh, the Frisian. So what we refer to as uh, as probably an F10 to F12 uh, cow. And um, and so we're producing about 280,000 kilograms of milk solids. Uh, so just over 1,500 milk solids on the milking platform. Uh, we uh, winter about two thirds of those cows on the farm on fodder beet, and our only purchased feed is uh, for this season has been 54 ton of palm kernel that comes from uh, comes from Malaysia, and uh, that's quite unique in New Zealand because our level of supplementary feed here is incredibly low. On average, New Zealand has really lifted the amount of supplementary feed purchased per cow in the last decade. It's gone from being close to nothing to on average last year was just on 1,000 kilograms per cow. So you've seen quite an intensification of the New Zealand dairy industry as, as effectively our milk price has come up to the same level as, uh, as most other exporting countries in the world. So that's brought a real change in the, uh, in the dynamics in our industry. But for our farming business at Medfin, our focus is very much on pasture and we only purchase supplement when we absolutely need. And typically that's to get through a pinch in spring, which will be right at the end of August, early September, just as we're uh, right at the height of calving. Um, probably the other unique thing for us is uh, we've got a Filipino couple uh, that are our contract milkers. They've been on this property since we purchased this farm back in 2016. And, um, and they're a couple of real champions for us. So uh, they're not scared of, uh, of working hard, but at the same time, they've got uh, a real happy-go-lucky nature, um, which is quite testament to the, uh, to the Filipino culture. And Filipinos make up now about one quarter of the New Zealand dairy farm labor force. So quite important for us. So New Zealand's ethnicity has massively changed in this last 15 years. Just a couple of shots again there of the dairy farm. So again, you see Mount Hutt in the distance above the fodder beet crop there on the left-hand side. And we'll typically average around about 23 to 25 tonnes of kilograms of dry, uh, sorry, 25 tonnes of dry matter per hectare. Uh, and like I say, about just on 20 hectares of fodder beet on, our, uh, on the dairy farm itself, Winters about two thirds of the cows, um, with the balance of, uh, of cows going up to where we graze our, uh, our heifer calves during the rest of the season. So everything's all calved at the end of September. Just moving now to dairy holdings. So dairy holdings is uh, so this is my day job, if you will, uh, when I'm not uh, plodding away in the weekend up at Methven and uh, with uh, with Paula, uh, Dad, and the family up there and so Dairy Holdings is, uh, is all South Island based and you can see from this slide here that we're in four locations, 76 farms, 60 of those are dairy and the biggest hub of those farms is located in Canterbury. And so Jason if you'd like to go to the next slide, that, uh, that's sort of a, a blown up view of Canterbury. You can't quite see uh, Christchurch on the right hand side but you can see Lake Ellesmere that just sits below Banks Peninsula. Ashburton, uh, actually where we're, uh, we're, we're uh, based for this, uh, this Zoom webinar is right in the middle of the screen. And you can see most of the dairy holdings farms around Canterbury there are located on the north side of the Rakaia River. And that's quite strategic for us given the importance of irrigation right down the east coast of the South Island. Thanks, Jason. So uh, Dairy Holdings uh, traces its start back to the, the, uh, to the effectively the, the break of the new millennia. And that's when a group of shareholders got together to pick up what were a group of uh, farms from the 1990s corporate dairy operations in New Zealand, Tasman Agriculture and Dairy Brands. I started my dairy career 
or corporate farming career with Tasman Ag uh, in, uh, in 1997. And, uh, and so basically when Dairy Holdings came in and bought most of those farms, they had no option but to take me at the same time. And uh, I guess they've been stuck with me ever since. And so what you'll see there is a bit of a plotted history of how the company has grown from the initial 30 farms back in 2001 to the 76 farms that we've got today. The unique thing with Dairy Holdings though, is that while there was $45 million introduced by shareholders in 2001, all of that money was repaid uh, and some by 2008. And when the global financial crisis hit New Zealand and the world, uh, and that meant that our milk prices tanked in the early, uh, or around that 2010 period, Dairy Holdings was, to my knowledge, the only multi-farm dairy business in New Zealand at the time not to require capital to be introduced. And so we've continued to pay uh, quite significant sums back to our shareholders, as well as uh, continuing to grow the company over that time. And as testimony to, to, I guess, the track record that we've had, in June 2019, we've got on the screen there, Sook Investments, that's a company owned by the uh, Canadian Public Sector Pension Fund. So they're a, uh, a, a multi-billion dollar uh, government uh, pension fund in Canada, and they effectively invested into dairy holdings when JD and RD Wallace elected to sell down their shares. So today, Dairy Holdings is relatively tightly owned. It's just the Armour and the Turley families. So they're both two New Zealand successful farming families that are almost like Maori or Iwi in their view. I don't think I needed to be worried about it. They take quite a long-term view. And, uh, and PSP have invested more recently, and they tell us that they equally take a long-term view of the sector and they're investing uh, for, uh, for a period that's well in excess of uh, 15 to 20 years. I guess time will tell. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jason. So just in terms of the governance and management of the company, so Dairy Holdings has had quite a strong culture around our governance and our board. Uh, basically, since we were formed, we've got uh, the three shareholders are represented on the board through Colin Armour, Murray Turley, and then uh, Yannick Bedouin from, uh, from Montreal in Canada. And we've got two independent directors, Greg Gent and Rod Hansen. And it's important though that the, that the chair is independent because with the company being relatively tightly held, every now and then when there become changes in shareholders, it's important that the company has been able to sort of keep uh, or plot um, and even course and always act in the best interests of the company as opposed to shareholders. Um, probably the other unique thing with Dairy Holdings is that the various shareholding groups also have observers on the board and that's part of the succession and training uh, for those family groups. We've got quite a tight uh, management team as well and I'm quite fortunate to have uh, you know, Blair Robinson, Morgan Galbraith and Jane Foles there is uh, effectively what makes up my quite tight uh, management team. So we have a pretty flat structure, but uh, but a team that's uh, held us in pretty good stead over the years. Thanks, Jason. Just the whole business is, uh, is founded on repeatable and simple systems. And that's, I guess, a flash way of saying pasture is it for us. And, uh, and the closer we adhere to the pasture growth curve, the more profitable our business has been over the years. And that's basically our whole mantra for our growth from the 30 farms to 76, and also the ability to pay out capital uh, over the years. Thanks, Jason. If you'd like to go to the next slide, Jason. So this uh, provides a quick snapshot of the farming operations this past season. So there it was 74 farms, 15 grazing blocks there. There's, uh, there's now the 60 dairy farms up from the 59 in this slide. But this just shows that we've got a number of different operating structures from managed farms through to contract milking, variable order share milking, 
right through to 100% herd ownership. All that's demonstrating is that we've got a number of structures on the farms where our people are able to build equity in livestock and continue to progress. And typically we've had over our history, anything up to five to 10 of our operators each year have moved on to, uh, to buy their own farms. So career succession and progression is a very important part of not just dairy holdings, but also the New Zealand dairy industry. Thanks, Jason. This is just an example of a milk curve, and this shows the milk curve from last season. And so you can see here that while we're all pasture, we've got very repeatable production year on year. And that's really thanks to the, uh, the Canterbury climate with irrigation. And you can see that subtle changes in climatic conditions uh, get presented through very subtle changes in those milk curves. At the end of the day though, those changes don't change too much at all. So thanks, Jason. Uh, and again, just demonstrating that career progress progression system. What this is showing on this slide is the total of 50 odd thousand cows across the dairy holdings business, 15,000 of those are owned by our operators on farm and testimony to that career progression structure. You see this slide shows a bit of tune between those various operating structures as people come and go and progress. And we need movement. We need people to be successful and to progress because that enables us to attract the best and brightest to operate those farms the next season. So interestingly enough, that there's about 3,000 cows are bought by our operators each year. Just moving now, thanks Jason, if you keep going to the next slide. So this slide here, just moving on now from dairy holdings to the wider dairy industry. So the dairy industry in New Zealand has, as you can probably imagine, has enjoyed really unprecedented growth over the last two decades. And, uh, but at the same time, the number of dairy herds in New Zealand has continued to contract. If we were looking at this slide from 20 years ago, you'd see that the quantum of milk production in New Zealand from the South Island would be pretty negligible. Most of it would have come from Waikato, so that's the light green area in the North Island, and then the, uh, the gray area in Taranaki. They would, have meant, they would have made up by far the, uh, the greatest proportion of New Zealand's production. Today, most of New Zealand's milk comes evenly from both islands. And Canterbury last year surpassed Waikato and Southland has now surpassed Taranaki. And I guess being South Island and being very parochial, uh, that's brought about a real change in the industry. And it's brought quite a business focus in the industry as the herd size has dramatically increased. The size, the financial size of dairy businesses has forever changed. And so it's now no longer just farming businesses, sorry, family businesses that make up the industry. They're now quite significant family businesses that have uh, a lot of professional operating structures and governance structures around them as well. Thanks, Jason. So this slide here just demonstrates for New Zealand, the challenge around operating profit. And because our operational returns or our milk price has bounced all over the show in recent times, it means that we've always got to have an eye on our cost structure. So quite often at an industry good level, our focus is on what is the break-even milk price. What this slide shows is that in the 2015-16 uh, the season, when the milk price in New Zealand dropped below $4 from record highs in the years prior, the New Zealand dairy farmer had an ability, probably unlike any other in the world, and again, I'm biased, where they can put their checkbook away, hanker down and survive a downturn. But what you also see in this slide is that like farmers all over the world, when our milk price lifts, our farm expenses tend to lift to match it. And so since 2016, we've enjoyed very, very stable milk prices. And this year, Fonterra has recently announced an indicative milk price for the 2020-21 season of $7.20 per 
per kilogram of milk solid. So we've enjoyed very stable earnings for the last four years, but what that's meant is that our costs of production have continued to eke up as an industry. And last year, not shown on this slide, but last year the dairy-based data set in New Zealand uh, suggested that the New Zealand break-even milk price was now $6 per kilogram of milk solids. The issue here though, is it's not the average, it's the bell-shaped curve. And even we're told at a $7.20 milk price, 15% of New Zealand dairy farms are not able to make interest and principal repayments. Now, for some of you on this uh, webinar, that might be alarming. Actually in New Zealand, that's quite a healthy level because when you've got that amount of pressure being applied, that creates opportunity for the next generation as well. The issue for New Zealand is, can we strengthen our balance sheets enough to withstand the challenges that I'm gonna talk about shortly? Thanks, Jason. So just moving quickly now through the, the trends and challenges. Thanks, uh, Jason, we'll keep moving quickly now. So this uh, slide really just touches on the MBOVIS challenge that I mentioned previously, and New Zealand's making very good progress at eradicating mycoplasma bovis from New Zealand. It came in here in 2017. The source, we're not quite sure, but what we do know is that now there are only 10 properties that are confirmed positive and they have now been depopulated. That's the very polite term from being, for being culled uh, over these last couple of months. And so at the moment, New Zealand is moving quickly to eradicate. We won't know exactly when we are free from the disease, but they tell us that continual testing over this next 10 years will just simply wake up one morning and the disease will be absent. So it's quite a positive story for New Zealand, not just around the fact that we've had systems in place that have been able to eradicate this disease, but it's really built a lot of trust in our markets into Asia because we've been able to show absolute traceability back to the farm gate. The other part on this slide really just touches on the challenge around carbon and methane. And that's where New Zealand is aiming to be carbon zero by 2050. But we have a split gas approach in New Zealand and our methane reductions are quite different to our carbon reductions. And methane is targeted to reduce to, uh, by 10% by 2030 and then within that wider range of up to 47% reductions by 2050. What exactly they are still remains to be seen. This slide here just shows the growing debt in the New Zealand dairy industry. And the, the, uh, the, the slide or the graph there rather shows the total amount of lending to agriculture. Dairy last year made up $40 billion of that total agriculture debt. The interesting thing though, is that last year, dairy paid down $2 billion of that. And this year, we're on track to do the same again. So while New Zealand has what many would call relatively high levels of gearing in our dairy industry, most dairy farms in New Zealand are now aggressively paying down debt for what has been a real change given that many farms we're simply interest only payers up to about five years ago. So New Zealand is refinding its profitability very quickly, but it needs to. Thanks, Jason. Just touch on this slide quickly, it's talking about immigration and the fact that I alluded to earlier that we have quite a number of Filipino, Indian and other Southeast Asian uh, workers on our farms in New Zealand. COVID's brought a real challenge in this space but as well as that, the New Zealand government is very focused on reducing the number of short-term uh, visa holders, you know, those on working visas to New Zealand. So even though COVID has brought this uh, home to us, even when we get past the restrictions internationally, it's unlikely that New Zealand's going to get any reprieve and the gates are unlikely to open for migrant workers coming into New Zealand. What that means is that all businesses in New Zealand are having to be employers of choice. We've really got to excel because there is a real war going on for labour in New Zealand. 
Thanks, Jason. With all these challenges, this slide here just demonstrates the, uh, the new attribute pricing that is coming from our milk processors. Fonterra have its rewards and recognition, or it's just been rebranded in the last week, their cooperative difference program. And yesterday they announced that 10 cents per kilogram of milk solids will be paid to those that uh, are the top performers in these categories on the screen at the moment. So it's a new world that's coming our way and where we get paid and recognized for things that are non sort of customer uh, uh, price issues, but now more focused on environment, animal welfare, uh, health and safety and how we treat people. So the world is changing and the expectations are changing with it. Thanks, Jason. So for New Zealand, that just really highlights the importance of pasture in our business. It is our international point of difference. We know that New Zealand and Ireland, and especially Northern Ireland as well, that this is the bit that resonates with most. It resonates with our customers, and it makes us different from the rest of the world. For the dairy holdings business, this graph here shows how we track our pasture harvested. And irrespective of any farm's milk production levels, the higher the amount of pasture we harvest per hectare, the higher our profit. In other words, for us, profit is sanity and production is absolute vanity. So we look at our pasture ability more so than what goes in the milk van. But what that means is that pasture is our point of difference and that's our, that's our story for our customer, which is becoming increasingly important. Thanks, Jason. But our focus is now moving to other things. Water quality is now, in this next few years, the number one issue within wider New Zealand. And I've got a couple of graphs here that if, if you're able to see them, this looks at water quality levels of some major European rivers. So those in the, uh, in the continent and then up around uh, Aberdeen as well. And you'll see there that the nitrate levels in those major rivers are up approaching well in excess of, uh, well, from 15 up to 35 parts per million of nitrate. The graph on the right-hand side shows the average or median uh, water, uh, sorry, nitrate concentrations in rivers in those various European countries. Now, you'll see the red line there on the graph on the left-hand side at 2.4 parts per million. That level is the level where New Zealand has set our maximum. So no river, no receiving water body in New Zealand is to be above that level. Now that's quite significant for us in terms of a change, but that's the change that's coming our way. Thanks, Jason. This graph here, just to put that in proportion, all of those rivers that are not darker on this slide in Northern Ireland are significantly above that limit that New Zealand is aspiring for. And so you'll see there that it's really only the rivers towards your west, uh, the western side of Northern Ireland are the ones that meet that standard that New Zealand is aspiring to. And it's interesting when I was doing a, a quick bit of research for this presentation, how many times Northern Ireland is mentioned as having some of the best water quality in, Northern, in all of Europe. So it just goes to show the ambition or the aspiration that New Zealand has in this space for water quality. Next slide, please, Jason. What this highlights is the, uh, the graph on the left-hand side shows where the highest nitrate losses are to groundwater all around New Zealand. And the key bit from that slide is that those lighter areas are the areas where most of the dairy cows exist in New Zealand. So it's very much been targeted as a dairy problem. The table on the right-hand side shows a number of rivers through Canterbury. And you'll see that well, the DIN number there is dissolved in organic nitrogen. That includes nitrate, nitrite, and ammonia. And those levels are largely below one. You'll see for our alpine rivers, they're well under one. In fact, they're nearly below 0.1. 
And so New Zealand already has absolutely pristine waters, but for a number of our rivers that are sourced in the foothills, they are higher. They're still lower than many of your rivers in Northern Ireland, but we are now having to reduce our farming intensity to bring those nitrate levels down. The time frame for that, we're told is a generation, but that in itself is an absolute aspiration. And for many, that's starting to really make us question what our future farming systems will look like in New Zealand. Thanks, Jason. Methane and carbon is the other big issue. And we, from recent research that Dairy NZ and Ag Research have done, they've shown that New Zealand has the most efficient carbon footprint for dairy worldwide. And uh, this shows our emissions per unit of milk solid. And that demonstrates that the pasture system, even though many that have significant um, uh, confinement farming systems worldwide have many tools that they can use. And you'll see there where the USA sits, it's still well above New Zealand. But the point is, is that the rest of the world is likely to catch us up in this space very quickly. So we need to do more and we need to do more quickly. Thanks, Jason. So New Zealand's got a real focus on how we reduce first and foremost our methane emissions per hectare. And you'll see there that this graph shows that in New Zealand with the technology currently with us, we have only one lever to pull and that's reduce the amount of feed eaten per hectare. What that means is to get that reduction, New Zealand farmers are likely to have to pull out their least profitable feed first. So if you think about what that means, that means that in a country we're already feeding very little supplement relative to the rest of the world, that supplementary feed is likely to be further removed from our farming systems over these next two decades as we aspire to reach these new reductions. Thanks, Jason. This graph here just simply shows where dairy holding sits relative to the dairy footprint that Fonterra has from its farms throughout the entire South Island. So dairy holdings is run of the mill, but what you'll see there is that for farms that have higher quantities of total feed eaten, so that's not pasture, that's total feed eaten, dairy holdings moves to the bottom end of that range. And so we believe that the pasture model that we're pursuing is where New Zealand is effectively having to go back to the future for how we can meet our methane reduction targets for the year ahead. And this slide here shows where we're sitting for a dairy holdings monitor farm and a, a project group that's been put together in central Canterbury, where we're aspiring to have higher levels of profitability, but with a lower methane footprint per hectare. So it's really challenging our farm systems where we're having to look at what are the different drivers of our profitability. So it's no longer about production. It's now all about profit for the lowest possible environmental footprint we can have. Thanks, Jason. This slide here simply goes the next step and looks at nitrous oxide. Now, nitrous oxide sits in the carbon bucket. So again, New Zealand has a split gas approach. So carbon and methane are treated separately. Nitrous oxide is part of carbon. So for us to reduce our carbon footprint in the future, we have no option but to pull back the amount of nitrogen fertilizer we're using on our pastures as well. So who would have thought that New Zealand would be regarded as being having you know, effectively moving so far away from what has been our core over a generation, but now we're having to go back to our historical systems, but do that with new technologies and do it well. Thanks, Jason. So this is the pathway that's been set for New Zealand. I won't go through it in any detail, but it simply shows that by uh, 2030, we must be making significant reductions. And New Zealand is effectively the country that's having to move down this pathway ahead of many other agricultural countries around the world. Thanks, Jason. So in summary, 
Yes, New Zealand has a, has a huge reliance, thanks to COVID, on agriculture, more so than we've had in recent years, but we've got some real headwinds, largely around uh, essential freshwater and also around carbon emissions. My belief is, is that that is and will be our competitive advantage for some time to come, and it presents a unique opportunity around pasture that's actually quite exciting. Our focus is more around profitability and environmental challenges than ever before. And actually, when New Zealand has a challenge like that, history tells us that we can adapt faster than most other farming businesses worldwide. So our view is, yes, it's going to be tough, but this will actually be the bit that can set us apart again in the future. So thanks, uh, thanks uh, Harold, and back to you. Thank you very much, Colin. Uh, certainly a very full and a very interesting presentation reflected in the number of questions that have come through. And if I could just kick off the questions uh, relating to your last slide there, where you're uh, saying that there could be a potential 10% reduction in uh, output. Now that is a, a massive change of direction for you. You alluded to the fact that uh, over the years, New Zealand uh, has grown rapidly in uh, milk production. So my question is, um, do you see somewhere else in the globe taking up the slack or will this lead to higher milk prices globally with uh, a tightening in supply? I think we've got to remember here, Harold, that, uh, that there's, there's actually still a very small proportion of the world milk that gets exported between countries. And so while New Zealand makes up a large proportion of international dairy trade, of international dairy consumed, we're still relatively small. So New Zealand is only 3%, or well, New Zealand and Australia combined rather, are only 3% of that international volume. So yes, you would expect that that could in time be reflected in international dairy prices. But I think what we're going to see is those international dairy prices will start to be challenged. No longer will dairy be the straight out commodity. We're expected to do so much more around our, our climatic footprints as well. But remember, New Zealand's markets are not Northern Hemisphere in terms of Europe or the States. They're mainly Asia. And our customers do not have the same requirement. Not yet. Actually, today, this pressure is coming on us from within New Zealand, it's our license to farm. So I think we will see continual appreciation in milk prices, but that's part of our license to continue to farm for the future as well. Okay, thanks Colin. Look, um, there's quite a number of questions here and I'll just take them as they come. Um, so first question is, Colin, how much staff turnover does dairy holdings have uh, would you rather recruit people with the right attitude rather than experience? <laughs> yes, uh, see that's from, from John. How are you, John? I hope you're well. Um, look, you, um, in New Zealand, we've seen a real drop in uh, staff turnover in the last few years, thanks to COVID, principally as people are now really hankering down and looking to, to keep the jobs they've got. For dairy holdings, we've got, in terms of our operators, so on the 60 dairy farms, we have 10 operators this year that are moving on, and probably half of those are looking to exit the industry. We need churn though, to be, to present the opportunities for the next group coming through. But really for the second part of your question there, John, it's the attitude is far, far more important than experience. Motivation is everything for us. And if you could recruit on one thing alone, it will be that. Okay, a uh, question from Alan Hobbs. What are the most important KPIs that you look for uh, each of the dairy farms? You look at for each of the dairy farms? Uh, the, the number one KPI, in fact, the only one that matters at all, is earnings before interest and tax per hectare. So, or, or operating surplus per hectare, depending what school you went to. For us, that KPI is the only one that matters. It's the only one that our bankers and our shareholders look at at the end of the day. And the only driver for that is the amount of pasture we harvest per hectare. We've modeled a lot of things over the years. And in New Zealand, the margin that we make from additional supplementary feed effectively only enables us to break even over time. 
So for us, it's solely pasture harvested. The other key parts that come with that is secondary, but it, are, it is things like staff engagement, lower staff turnover, those sorts of things. So at the end, it's about the motivation of our people, but that's what drives profit. Okay, a question from Tim Morrow. Will the same level of irrigation be allowed into the future? Look, that's a very good question. New Zealand is fortunate in that we are a water rich country. Just to put that into context, the same amount of rain falls in New Zealand per annum as the entire continent of Australia. And bear in mind that includes the rainforest areas up in the northern part of Australia and, uh, and the areas that get the monsoons. So New Zealand gets a lot of rain. Our west coast gets more than our east coast. But as we're faced with climate change, what we're starting to see is that parts of the North Island that have historically had very reliable rainfall, they're now being tested. So New Zealand is becoming an engineering challenge. In the South Island, most of the East Coast is already irrigated. So that ship has sailed. I think the opportunity around irrigation is huge and that will mainly now be a North Island story. It also gives those that have irrigation a lot of options. They can get consistency of crops, they can grow more consistent pasture, but it lifts you to a whole new level. And what we've seen is that wherever irrigation has gone in in local communities, the benefit for the local town is immeasurable compared to what happens on farm. It multiplies up significantly. Irrigation will always, I believe, be a real key for New Zealand's future. And again, I'm biased. Okay, uh, question from James Taylor. Is farm ownership still a realistic ambition for young farmers in New Zealand? I have read that it has become much more difficult to progress. If this is correct, what are the reasons for it and what is the key to achieving farm ownership? I, I, I should really let my father answer this question because as I've grown up, the story that I have always been told is that farm ownership, wherever you are, but particularly in New Zealand, is possible, but it's only possible if you have a singular focus, you're prepared to knuckle down, make personal sacrifice, and you've got real goals and aspirations to get there. Those that think they can sleepwalk their way to farm ownership never ever get there. In my belief, farm ownership, I believe, is more possible today than it has ever been. And the reason why I say that is because New Zealand has more challenges than we've ever had. Wherever we have challenge, you have people that lose their will to stay on the journey, and that creates the opportunity for the next generation. New Zealand's dairy earnings are now for top operators as strong as I have ever seen in my career in farming, and I think it actually means that the future is better than we have ever known. We're starting to see a number of our young operators start that are, that are the real top performers start to step out and purchase farms after what was a real shock in milk price in the mid uh, 2010s. I think the outlook here is really bright, but there's only a small group that will ever make it. And that's, that's great, that's the way it should be. Okay, um, look, due to time constraints, I can only take a couple of more questions and I'm taking them as they come to me. Uh, so a question from Jason McMinn, what costs specifically would have been saved between 1415 and 1516? The, the main cost that New Zealand farmers breathe in and out on in their business is typically feed and grazing. And so when the pressure comes on, farmers simply feed less. And in many cases, that's reducing stocking rate to optimize the amount of feed that's fed per hectare. So that's the first lever that gets pulled. The next lever is repair and maintenance spend. So the discretionary things that you do on farm tend to stop. So people hanker down and they make do, they live on cash. And then ultimately, when the squeeze really comes on, that's when you've got other farm inputs that people tend to look at. For us, the last thing you ever pull back on 
is fertilizer. That's your key for the future. So every there are there are lots of those other levers first that we would ever touch. Okay, um, a question from Harper Kilpatrick, and I believe that's coming from Australia. And uh, Colin, how does New Zealand dairy plan to reduce methane emissions? And we have to make this the last question, uh, as I say, due to time constraints. I should be, uh, this should be painted, uh, Harper, but um, in terms of New Zealand step in the next period of time, the initial easy win is to pull out less profitable feed in the farm business. That brings the total quantity of feed feed down. But to get the next step of reduction after that, that's where it's a whole lot harder. And this is where the whole world is looking at what's that silver bullet. And there's things like uh, different methane emission levels from different feeds. So our brassicas have lower methane, uh, give off lower methane than other feeds. We've got other things with vaccines. We've got methane inhibitors. And so already we know that for confinement farms, there's the opportunity for feed additives that can already be used. For New Zealand, there's no silver bullet. And the other bit is, is that GM, we're not allowed to do that in New Zealand at the moment, but New Zealand is investing in off or overseas research in this space to see whether our pastures or our grasses and our clovers can produce milk with lower methane emissions as well. So there's quite a number of things that are being looked at, but we don't have to solve this in one day. We've got a generation to do it, but we do need to be making significant progress uh, by 2030. So we've got a classic phrase that we are increasingly using in New Zealand, is that we've got to be on the journey, but panic slowly. And so I think the opportunity is still really sound for those that can get there, but if we can keep our heads and make simple progress year on year, when we look back in the rear vision mirror, we'll actually be amazed how far we've come. Okay, thanks, Colin. Um, your contribution to our conference tonight has been fantastic. The questions, uh, as I say, came through thick and fast there. There's still some which are unanswered, uh, but unfortunately we have to move on. Um, hopefully you'll stay with us for the rest of the conference and I'm now going to hand back to Charlie, our president. Thank you, Colin. Thanks very much, Harold. It's been a privilege and I'll try and answer most of those questions uh, over the uh, chat in the next few while. Thanks, Harold. That'd be great. Thank you. Harold, thanks. Colin, thanks for a brilliant presentation. I'm sorry I have to wind this up. I'd love to get you back because there's some great questions and great discussion going there. But when we're Arthur sitting on the sidelines here and he's probably getting a bit anxious. Uh, before I move on, folks, to our next speaker, uh, I want to take five minutes to talk about the Ulster Grassland Society Innovation Awards competition. Um, due to the coronavirus restrictions this year, the society was unable to run its annual Grassland Farm of the Year competition. So, as an alternative, with the support from Dance Bank, we launched the Ulster Grassland Society Dance Bank Grassland Innovation Awards competition. Uh, this has allowed us to do things without obviously going on to farm. Uh, sponsored by Dance Bank, the awards are seeking to celebrate all things innovative by capturing the on-farm inventions and ideas that are helping local farmers to be, be progressive and efficient. Applications for the competition took the form of a short video and the scope of the competition allowed for a wide range of ideas to be submitted. From novel devices for grazing infrastructure, to different ways of managing grazing or establishing swords, to new methods for monitoring animal performance. So we had a wide range of entries, and I'd like to give thanks to those members who submitted videos. The quality was a very high standard, but unfortunately, we weren't able to show the videos tonight, but the winning and commended entries videos will be made available on the Ulster Grassland Society website in the coming days. Now, due to the format of this event, we, we can't have an official presentation, which we would usually have for the Grassland Farm of the Year Award, but there will be some press coverage about that this in the next few weeks to give you more detail of the winner and what was what was submitted. So this tonight, it's my pleasure to announce that Kilkeel Beef and Sheep Farmer, James Henderson, is the overall winner. 
His innovation looked at how new technology could be used on his farm to easily provide increased information on animal performance and to aid decision making on his beef and sheep enterprise. There are also two highly commended entries, and those were from dairy farmer Aldo O'Neill and dairy farmer Andrew Wright. Uh, well done, folks, and hopefully he'll be hearing from you in the future. Now, this uh, competition took a lot of work, and especially I must, on behalf of society, give thanks to the work of Dr. Debbie McConnell at AFBI for leading this competition and making it work, and also especially to Rodney Brown of Dance Bank for sponsorship. Thank you very much, folks. And hopefully we'll hear about that in the near future. Now, on to, oh, onward with tonight's uh, agenda. Our next speaker uh, is Arthur Fernell. And there's a connection here with Northern Ireland. And the guy from Australia was asking the question, believe it or not, Arthur was his best man. So Arthur's been in Northern Ireland a few times. And I think the last time I heard him speak was at a best man speech at uh, the hotel in, in Newcastle. So Arthur is a ninth generation dairy farmer. He's milking 400 crossbred cows on the Cheshire Plain. He runs a predominantly grass-based system looking to maximize mixed dollars from herd health. He's an Arla member and has an Arla UK 360 milk contract. In 2004, he undertook a Nuffield scholarship entitled Attracting the Next Generation into Dairy Farming, something which is close to his heart now that his youngest son, Edward, who currently studies agriculture at Reading University, is considering a career in, in dairying. Arthur has always been an active member of the Arla Democracy and is currently one of two UK farmer directors on the Arla Foods AMBA board representing the interest of the UK members. He is the Arlo UK area chairman, and until recently, he was a board member of Derry UK. Arthur, you're very welcome, and I'm going to hand over to you for the next 25 minutes or so. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Charlie. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. Yep. And yeah. just to say, um, it's, it's a great honor to be invited to speak uh, on this virtual conference. Um, and also just to say, I've got very um, fond memories um, of my visits to you and your family, uh, mainly in the eighties, to be fair, uh, as, you, as you say, I was best man to your brother and it's good to see that he's on this, uh, on this conference and I'm sure he'll have an awkward question for me later. And I actually owe him an email. He did email me at, at Christmas with his news and I haven't emailed him back. So uh, it'll, it'll, um, it'll get done. Um, also just to say um, that more recently I've come across John Dunlop, um, who I'm sure some of you will know well. Um, he and I uh, shared a seat at the Dairy UK Farmers Forum, uh, a great guy, got to know him well. Uh, and, and, and I was fortunate from that forum to get voted onto the Dairy UK board uh, and came across Nick Whelan um, and Michael Hanley, um, CEOs of your, of your local dairy co-ops. Uh, and I think you're blessed with some very capable people uh, in, charge of your, uh, in charge of your dairy industry. But just moving on, if you can just move on the slide, please. Just a little bit um, about me. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm actually a ninth generation dairy farmer. It does say eighth there. Um, so I farm on the Cheshire Plain. Um, we have um, about 410 crossbred cows. We farm on heavy clay, um, which means that um, I have to house my cows during the winter months. So I have the cost of cubicle sheds and silage and silage pits. So um, I need output to sort of um, pay for those extra costs during the winter months. But I'm quite unique in Cheshire that I do continue to graze um, pretty much for as many months as is possible throughout the grazing season. Whereas many of my neighbours, um, for many different reasons, have chosen to um, go fully housed. And there's a lot of my close friends and, and, and close neighbours who are milking three times a day. Um, you know, sort of 12,000 litre yields. I've, you know, you know um, I didn't go down that route and I'll come on to the reasons for that in a few minutes. Um, I'm a tenant. Um, I'm a tenant on the Grosvenor estate. Uh, so the Duke of Westminster, uh, um, and he has links, his family have links back to Northern Ireland, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, 
He's a great landlord uh, on the home farm here. Uh, I've got what we call an AHA tenancy. That's a three generation tenancy. Uh, I'm the second generation. So by, by rights, my son, Ed, if he wants to farm, um, is entitled to take the tenancy on with no questions asked. Um, but more recently, I've expanded the farm. I've been very fortunate. Um, a farm next door came vacant. Again, it was um, from the same landlord. Uh, I said, could I farm it? Um, they said, yes. Uh, so um, I took on the farm next door. And then I was pressing them for any extra land that they might have spare. And just by chance, they bought my neighboring farm and offered it all to me. So I've just been incredibly fortunate um, that this land has all become available over the last sort of 15 years or so. Um, uh, so I have no assets in land whatsoever. Um, my investments in the farm is in the cows, uh, a few machines, but not many. Um, I've had to build a few sheds to, uh, to house the extra cows. Um, and what that means, instead of sort of paying down finance um, and loans, um, I've been able to invest off farm. So um, I have got some non-farming investments, uh, which you know, makes life um, interesting. Um, if you just go on to the next slide, please. Yes, so um, I'm I, I'm different to my neighbours, and I think the I think the reason for that is, um, as Charlie said earlier, that um, I was fortunate to win a Nuffield scholarship um, 15 years or so ago, uh, which took me, like many Nuffield scholars, to uh, to Australia and New Zealand, um, and actually Denmark. I had three weeks in Denmark and Hungary, um, and um, I was looking at sort of well. Um, at farming systems simple enough to attract the, the next generation but clearly on these trips you look at all sorts of farming you know, dairy farming activities and um, I came back with I think four key things that I knew I had to change at the time I was sort of pushing for yield I had Holstein cows I was sort of pushing for 10,000 liters on a, on, on, on a graze system not surprisingly the, and the wheels were dropping off because it's very difficult to keep in Holstein cows um, healthy on a graze system. And I came back with some key messages. And firstly, you know, that if you're gonna to continue to graze cows, don't graze Holsteins because it doesn't work unless you're an, an excellent operator. Um, so I said, right, I need to change. Uh, so I had a decision to make, I either change the system to suit the cow, which is what my neighbors have done and put them all indoors all year round, um, or I change the cow. And I had dabbled with a few Montbelliards sort of a few years before. So I made a, a decision at the time I was going to change the cow. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, I also recognized that um, I had to improve, improve soil health uh, because it was poor compared to elsewhere around the world. And that's what I've tried to do. Um, I also recognize that you know, the rations that um, other, other countries' cows are being fed has, has um, well, is a much healthier ration, uh, far more fiber, um, and, and I changed my nutritionist and ration. Um, and also, um, I wanted to milk cows quickly. If you go to any country in the world where the owner of the business actually is still doing the milking, uh, milking times and milking parlors are such that milkings can be quick, um, sort of un in under two hours, typically in Ireland and, New and, and in New Zealand, whereas if you go into the States where the owners aren't milking the cows, milking times aren't important and you know they go on forever so at that time I was going to milk cows myself so I put in um, in, a, in a big parlor and again I'll come on to that um, I think um, it's also uh, important to say that um, in recent years um, I'm very fortunate again to have been uh, voted on to the board of Arla Amber there's two of us in the UK uh, who sit on the board that does take up probably two to three days a week well, away from the farm pre-COVID, um, but actually all my work's done now from this desk on these sorts of calls. Um, and that's given me huge insight um, into, in, you know, into dairying, into the business behind dairying. But also, um, Arla, I think, is very much on the front foot when it comes to looking forward to what's going to happen in years to come, um, you know, along the lines of Colin's um, thoughts. Um, and I'm super excited uh, ab about what's coming down the road and the future. And again, I'll come on to um, on onto that. Um, so in terms of my on-farm performance, I'm sure there are better operators. My, my yield from forage is about 2,900 uh, 
liters, you know, I've, I've been higher. Um, uh, I've never actually hit the 4,000, which I'm a bit embarrassed about, but I'm sure some of you guys out there will do that easily. Um, yeah, current yields about 8,500 liters, but the Arla contract pays purely on fat and protein. So actually yields in terms of liters means little to me these days. Uh, we, you know, we're just constantly looking for fat and protein. And I'll be quite honest, my move to a crossbred cow has given me for, um, an awful lot more fat and protein. And I hadn't planned it for that reason, but it has been one of the biggest benefits of all uh, of going to a, um, onto a crossbred cow. Feed rate at the moment is 0.33 kilos a litre. It costs to productions uh, 29p, that includes rent, that includes finance. And because I'm away from the farm, in non-COVID times, I've had to take on an extra member of staff to cover my absence. So there's probably another one and a half pence per litre on there, uh, extra staff cost than perhaps would be um, would be the norm. And then on this on this milk on this chart, finally, um, my current milk price is 33.35 pence per litre. Um, that's including 13th payment. We've just had a, a large ARLA meeting today. And our board of representatives um, have voted uh, a board um, a recommendation to give a 13th payment of 1.75 euro cents per litre. So that is included in that figure. And just to mention Arla UK 360. So this is an, an, is an enhanced welfare programme, but it also, it also looks um, at people, it looks at the environment, it looks at the community, economic resilience and R&D. And that program um, is worth an extra 0.94 pence per litre to me. Um, I'm specifically linked to Morrison's, the supermarket, but there's a whole host of extra standards that I have to achieve for that 0.94. It's closely monitored uh, and we're audited annually, um, but it's a very robust um, program. And we certainly um, feel that more and more retailers will be looking at similar programs. We've already got it with Tesco. Um, it's not quite as mature on the continent, but we think that's the way it's going. If you can just go on one slide, please. So just a little bit about my, my crossbreeding program. Um, this is, a, this is a, a Monte Cross heifer. And, that, and, and that's what I'm now um, I'm using. So I started out, out on my cross on my crossbreeding journey with a Swedish red, uh, and they were great. Um, but when they got to sort of third, fourth lactation plus, the udders pretty much disappeared. Um, you know, there's nothing that brings a better udder to the party to the, than it, you know than the Holstein in my in my view, and the Swedish reds. They just didn't last long enough, you know, loads of milk. So then I, um, I dabbled in Danish red um, and had a similar issue. And then I made an error um, because I tried uh, the Norwegian reds and I've got a lot, of Nor a, a lot of Norwegian reds in the herd. They have much better udders in my opinion, but they don't give the milk. Um, so I was getting a bit frustrated. Um, I'd had a few Monty's milking um, previously. So, um, I've now crossed everything with a Monty. And just to be clear, my crosses are Montbelliard, Holstein, Montbelliard, Holstein. Uh, but I'm very selective on the Montbelliard. Um, I'm always choosing the best uddered bulls uh, because nothing, as I say, brings udders to the party like Holstein. And I want my cross beds to last a long time. And they do. We're sort of averaging you know, five lactations out of them. Um, so, so they're healthy. Um, the fertility is um, is really good. If you just move on a slide, uh, there's just another one. These girls are in their working clothes. Again, this one is a is a is um, is a heifer, um, you know, and and is it is a typical cross in my herd. And just go on again, please. Just to talk a little bit about about my herd health. Um, so yeah, so in terms of the positives that come from from crossbreeding, um, I think health, uh, fertility particularly, my fertility index is 28. That's uh, conception rate um, multiplied by um, the number of cows seen bulling out of 100. Um, fat and protein is tremendous. I mean, calving ease is 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 I mean, is massively easier uh, than I ever had with my Holsteins. They last a long time. Lameness is better, but 
But what I would say, because they're big cows, when they do go lame, and you know, they are hard to get right. If it's a nasty sole ulcer or whatever, then they are quite difficult to, you know, to get right again. Um, there are a few issues, which I think, you know, only, only, you know, if I give you the balanced view, um, I carve my animals at about two years of age. Um, these crossbreds, they're not mature at two. Uh, I think the Holstein is. Um, they don't mature until two, two and a half, so, you know, two and a half, I would say. So what I find is that, you know, they sort of uh, don't really peak production maybe until month four or five. It's quite, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, it's quite sort of bizarre compared to what you'd expect with other breeds. Um, but then into the second and third lactations, they and they fly. Um, there's no benefit, I don't think, in mastitis, mastitis resistance. Uh, cell counts are OK, but, you know, they're not brilliant. Um, they're a big cow for a grazing system. They've got big feet. Um, we have got quite a good network of tracks, um, but I think without that, we'd struggle. Obviously, a little bit less milk than a Holstein, but I don't think by, by much, you've got to choose a good temperament. Um, you know, I'm, you know, I'm typically sort of trying to find best in breed. You sort of do question whether the French give us the best choices of the bulls available. Um, and, and, and I think also, as with any crossbred, you can't genomically test. Um, so that is, a, you know, that is a negative because clearly that is, you know, that is the way to better breeding and quicker genetic gain going forward. Um, the flip side of that is that um, I've been caught out by buying, um, I went to Denmark um, to buy a few cows a couple of years ago after crossbreds, couldn't find any. So I ended up bringing home a few Holsteins, a big error. I'm sure now that most of the animals that are on the market um, are the genomically tested animals that um, are the bottom end. <laughs> These animals weren't great, uh, uh, you know, not a wise move. But of course, if you buy a crossbred, you know it hasn't been genomically tested because it, you know, it, um, um, I mean, it can't be done, uh, and, and therefore you're not getting somebody else's rubbish. You sort of, you, you know, you're sort of buying what you see. If that, uh, if that makes sense. I'm just conscious of time. Charlie's given me a big, a big remit. Um, and then he said, oh, only 25 minutes, be done by then. So um, that's why I'm rattling through. I think just one further point on the crossbreds, uh, which I've never ever heard anybody mention this to me before, but we get quite a lot of what I call udder sores, udder cleft dermatitis. This is the nasty sore that's right up in the cleft of the udder. And, um, and it, I guess like a lot of farmers, you know, we have them and haven't really thought too much about them. But one, I think about three years ago, one autumn, we lost about five cows and they all had pneumonia type symptoms. And we just couldn't work out what was going on um, until the vet found a paper um, that said that typically um, uh, Swedish and, um, and Danish reds, um, they're more prone to these udder cleft dermatitis sores. And what happens is, is they often, you know, the sores are very close to the milk vein. Um, what happens is the milk vein, you know, if the sore is particularly bad, the infection gets actually into the blood. The blood then goes into the lung of the animals where abscesses form, uh, abscesses burst. The animals then breathing in and out this bacteria through her lungs and the lungs get further infested and it manifests itself uh, in, a, in a pneumonia type condition. Um, so what we do now is every month uh, on the parlor, we actually score the cows. We have a, a, little, a little torch on a, on a mechanics mirror um, and we sort of look at the udders and if there's any nasty udder sores, we treat them and the treatment's quite um, simple. It's just um, a spray with a, a teramycin spray. We just you know, clean them up and then spray them with a teramycin spray. And we haven't lost any since, but it's just, it is an extra job. And you know, apparently, it is a, a typical issue with um, you know with that particular breed. Um, so if we just move on uh, one again, please. Next slide. I think I mentioned uh, on my Nuffield scholarship that um, nothing. You just if you can just go back one. Sorry. I mentioned that one of the um, things I wanted to do was to have pretty quick quick milkings. I did have a, have a picture of a milking parlor somewhere, but yeah, so this is it. So just, just out of interest, I put this in. I'll be honest with you, it's, it's too big for my herd size, but the parlor I put in 
15 years ago, within five years, it was too small. We extended it within five years, it was too small again. And when I put the next parlor in, I said, I'm never gonna have a parlor that's too small again. So this will probably take double the cows um, if, if, you know, if we do indeed double up, um, if that's what my son Ed wants to do. Um, but, but yeah, just sort of give you an, ov an, ov an overview. And then again, if we can just go on one slide. Yes, so so just you know, um, I'm just looking at the challenges and opportunities um, going forward, and you know, I'm I'm at a bit of a crossroads, I guess. Um, I'm 56. Um, I've got a son potentially coming home. Uh, Ed is um, is 20. Um, he's at Reading University, which is where I went and my wife went. Um, he's studying agriculture. Um, and you, you know, and there's a very strong chance that uh, that he'll come home to farm. I don't want him home yet. He needs to go away. He needs to work. I think Harper, you might have a guest at some stage uh, in Australia, um, if that's okay. Um, but it's an interesting conundrum because um, not many people his age are looking at agriculture as a, as a career. Um, I mean, for me, I sort of I sat back a couple of years ago and thought, you know, do you know what? I'm not going to invest anymore on in my farm. You know, if he comes home and he wants to go fully housed and put robots in, what's the point in me putting cow tracks in and drinking troughs and, um, you know, uh, and all the stuff linked linked to a grazing system? Um, and then I thought, you know what, I'm not going to sit back and not invest because, well, A, it's boring uh, and B, you know, and B, you've got to progress. So uh, what I did was, it, well, I knew that subsidies were, were on the way out and that's what's going to happen. As you know, we're going to be paid less in subsidies. So I put up a new shed, um, 120 cows uh, in, in that shed. I actually went out and bought cows. Some of these were the ones from Denmark, bad move. Um, and um, I've now got a business which I think would mean that if, if and when subsidies go completely, that I can survive not flourish maybe, but I can survive in a in in a world with no subsidies. Um, I think that was the right move. I'm investing in more cow tracks this year, um, but it, it has made me sit back and think a little bit. And and obviously, I've got to consider what his thoughts are um, for the future, etc. And and I think the future, and Colin touched on this, is just going to be so different to the future you know that I had when I was his age and. You know, it's really interesting. I mean, my dad, um, he died about eight to 10 years ago, but when he was a little lad, he would have probably um, been out, out and, uh, you know, out sort of, you know, with horses in the fields. And when he died, there was, you know, there's cows sort of being milked in robots and driverless tractors. And I'm sort of thinking that the same change might happen again. And that's why I'm so excited. Um, it's going to be quite scary what's coming down the road. Um, but I think it's going to be really interesting. And I think if you can get your head around it all, uh, there's going to be huge opportunities. And that's why I'm actually very much encouraging him to come home. You know, where the cows fit into all this, I'm not sure. I'll come on to that again in a minute. But if we can just go on, on to the next slide, please. I think, I think sort of central to this is, um, and this is what I picked up on my Nuffield scholarship, is that in the next generation are, are you know, they're a different breed. Um, they're a different breed than perhaps any other breed that's come through. Um, and they're all of these things, you know, they're overconfident, they're impatient, they're, you know, they're more streetwise, they want instant success. You know, they're competitive, they're definitely mature earlier, they're definitely better educated. But I think the big one, is the one on the left is that they work to live not live to work i think um i don't think that they're going to come hey he's going to come home or anybody of his age and perhaps work the hours that perhaps we worked when we were his age and when we came back home it, you know they want to sort of live life and um, that they don't want to be tied to the back end of a cow um and i think for me that that's quite important about how how things progress i mean I'm 56. When he comes back, he's probably I'm going to be sort of in my late 50s. So I'm sort of going to be thinking about slowing down, which you know perhaps means he'll have have control if indeed he does come back. Of, of course, he'll have control um, at a young age, if you like. They always say the best farmers are the ones that have control at an early age. Um, and I'm I'm just hoping to take more of a backseat role. My plans never come to fruition. I hasten to add, but um, 
But I just, I, I just think unless you understand them um, and their traits and what they want out of life, it's very difficult to accommodate them. Um, and this, and this, and this work to live, not live to work, I think is crucial. I, th I think you know they're not as money driven. Um, you know, most of these kids have had more in their lives than most of us had when we were their age. You know, we've spoilt them, if you like. Um, you know, we've given them too much. You know, I, I worry, are they hungry enough? And my wife thinks they are. <laughs> um, I'm not so sure, but uh, but I guess we'll have to we'll have to wait and see. If you can just go on on one slide again, please. And, and you know, I, I'm 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 just thinking about the world you know, that he's going to come home to, um, you know, there's, and there's, I think there's going to be an agricultural revolution. I know it's, I know it's talked about, there's opportunities and there's threats. And I think one of the beauties of being an Arla farmer is that, is that Arla very much on this, um, as I said before, you know, I think we're on the front foot and a lot of our members, uh, they expect Arla to advise and guide. Um, and, and certainly we're, you know, we're listening a lot um, we're picking up as much as we can, and we're sort of, you know, speaking to some, you know, some pretty um, strong experts in various fields. Um, you know, we have to, um, you know, we have to listen to our members to sort of, you know, see and understand what they want. Um, and I think Arl, Arl is good at doing this. And I think I just want to spend the last sort of ten minutes or so uh, just looking at the future because there are opportunities and there are threats. And but I'm super excited, as I said earlier, about the opportunities. But Let's let's get the negatives out of the way first, and 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 start thinking um, about the threats because you know let's be honest they are you know they are there, um, and I'm going to start with the vegan challenge, um, and you know and and it's real uh, you know you know there's no doubt about it, it's probably not as big as we think it is, uh, and our CEO you know he will he will say well hang on you know there's any vegans north of the Alps in Europe on the east and west coasts of the US and in Australia and New Zealand. Everywhere else around the world, they pretty much don't exist. And we get so hung up um, on what they think, on what they say, and what they do. I was very fortunate um, as, a, as a new Arla board member, I did a bit, of a, a bit of a tour around some of our international markets. And I was uh, in Lebanon, where we've got quite a big business uh, with a trading partner. And we're having dinner with him. And it was at the time of, um, of Brexit, and he said, he said, what's the big challenge in the UK and Europe apart from Brexit? And I said, it's got to be the vegan challenge. And he said, he said, what's this word vegan? And I said, I said, it, I mean, it's people that don't eat meat or drink milk and eat dairy. He said, how can they survive? Surely they will die. He'd never actually heard of the word vegan. And this was what two and a half, three years ago. So I don't think it's going to be as big a threat um, as we think it is, um, and we've you know we've gotten all 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 this issues and all this all all this stress and challenge from the plant-based drinks that are sort of you know taking our 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 liquid milk sales and you know they are you know it is it is, um, it is slow it, it is small numbers but it's in you know but it is in quite high growth and, and the reality is that some of these plant drinks they're devoid of any nutrition whatsoever some of them have got two percent solids in maybe 1% barley or oats or almonds, and 1% emulsifiers that make them white. Uh, the carbon cost of, of some of them, particularly the almond milk, is, absolute, is absolutely astronomical, and they taste like shit. Um, and here we are worried about them. Uh, and, and I think it's important also you know, to note that in the US at the moment, um, there's been vegans over there perhaps longer than there has in, in Europe. There's some nutritionists saying to their 50 plus year old vegan clients that nutritionally when you get older it's virtually impossible to have a healthy balanced diet and keep it vegan and they're actually recommending that some of these some of these vegans actually start eating dairy protein at the least the quality protein that's in dairy uh, so you know it is a challenge and i'm not sort of I'm, I'm, you know and I'm, I'm, and I'm not saying it isn't but we do get hung up on them and then and then and then the next challenge um, is this industrial meat and milk manufactured in a vat. In fact, Arla Foods have got a very small stake in one of these companies, just so that we know what's going on. Um, my son, Ed, he's at Reading, as I said earlier, one of his lecturers has told him that milk's got 20 years because it'll all be produced in a, um, in a stainless steel vat on an industrial estate somewhere. 
that's just complete rubbish that will never happen it will be there and and you know and it might get more popular it's very very expensive um, to produce there's big question marks over the carbon cost of producing these products uh, and also the quality protein we don't think the quality of protein is there so i don't know there's a lot of money going into it um but it could just be um be a fad i'm just conscious of time um um, actually, Charlie did mention, and he did ask me to mention 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 Brexit. This was actually, um, you know, before Christmas. He asked me to speak, and obviously Brexit was uh, was a big thing. You know, Brexit obviously, you know, it's, you know, it's nowhere near as big an issue as we thought it would be. Certainly from an Arla perspective, we, we were very very worried about a hard Brexit, and we were and we were campaigning and lobbying all across Europe, all all European politicians. It would have been a disaster for us. I think it would have been a disaster for the UK economy. Um, so it's massively, massively, massively better than it could be. But there are still problems with Brexit, and I know you in Northern Ireland, you know, are feeling it. Um, you know, we actually sell a lot of our products uh, in, in, you know, over the water with you. There are issues getting products in, um, and and a lot of the restrictions on on the borders haven't come into play yet. Um, you know, they've given us a bit of a free reign, if you like, until the 1st of April. More restrictions will come in then. And then I think again on the 1st of July. Um, so, you know, there are, I think there are a few problems coming down the line. Yeah, the non-tariff barriers, the, you know, the border checks, et cetera, they come at a cost. Arla imports a lot of products out of Europe into the UK, out of the UK into Europe, you know, so we are in the thick of this. Um, it could cost us 10 million quid, um, you know, in terms of those of those borders um, checks, etc. Um, I'll not go through all of these um, because, you know, in the interest of time. But just to touch on carbon tax, um, this is a this is a bit of an unknown. Um, there's a lot of talk. Um, the government seems to be very hesitant. Um, things are moving quite slowly, um, but it's a potentially big one. Uh, because if it does come in, it could hit um, milk and dairy quite hard. Again, it's a complete unknown. I think it's like a hang, on, you, know, you know, it's a hang on to your hat time. If it did come in, there would be, I think, big changes very quickly. But it's certainly, uh, you know, it's certainly one that we are watching. Um, and then, like Colin, uh, the the methane and ammonia picture. Um, I think all all of this is going to come with cost. We know that in Europe, um, there's lots of talk um, about covering slurry stores, about urine and feces being mixed on uh, on yards, about fertilizer usage, et cetera, et cetera. You know, one of the ways to reduce methane emissions is to have less cows. And that's why I put that, that there. And it's a debate that hasn't really started yet. I mean, you may have heard that Royal Friesland Campina, they've actually now put a quota on their members' production. There's absolutely no talk of that in Arla whatsoever. Um, but um, a consultant said to me recently that actually, you know, the, you know, the lowest 10 percent um, performers in your in your in your herd are only 65 percent of the average. So there is a case for getting rid of 10 percent of your cows and actually having a much more efficient herd. Um, and in some cases, I'm led to believe increased profitability. Um, but it, it's something I think that needs to be considered. So, you know, less cows, less methane, global cooling. That's the picture. But it's certainly I wouldn't want you to think that Arla's thinking along those lines at all. Obviously, it's something that we will we will discuss. Um, but um, I didn't, you know. But I think they're all the sort of negatives out of the way. Let's you know, let's move on and finish up with the positives because these are the sort of you know, this is the world that Ed's my son's going to be moving into, um, and. Um, I think I think you know the exciting part about this is the bottom right where we says where we say lowering carbon cost per litre linked to more productive farms, and the good thing is that it is statistically true that the farms with the lowest carbon cost per litre tend to have the highest production costs, uh, and and that makes sense. I mean, it's good news for Colin because you know Colin's figures suggest they are the lowest in the world. Um, but you know, if you if you think about what you have to do to lower your carbon costs, there's a whole host there's a whole host of different things that can be done, and, and we've got um, a number of lever a number of levers what we're sort of ad, um, advising farmers on. So it's things like lower your mortality rate, have more efficient cows. I know it's easy to say, 
fertilizer use, there will be green fertilizer. Don't ask me what it is or, uh, you know, um, or anything about it, but there will be fertilizer that you can put on your land, which is carbon neutral. It will not be made from the same products that fertilizer is made from today. Um, I think I think breeding um, and genomics will come onto on the on 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 onto the next slide, but the, but I think one of the interesting ones, the really interesting ones, is that as on the top left, farming will be the solution, not the problem, and that will have to be the case. Uh, so unless Elon Musk comes out with some 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 mega mega suction device that sucks all the carbon out of the air and dumps it into massive big glass tanks underground, which let's face it is unlikely to ever happen farms have got to be part of the solution and this is where the carbon credits and the carbon sequestration comes in and we're already seeing this in its infancy where organizations are paying farmers for their carbon credits um, now this is a very unregulated market i mean in australia you know, and harper might know more about this microsoft are buying carbon credits um, off wilmot farms i think is in new south wales Microsoft are also buying carbon credits off, um, off farms in the US. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and as a company, I'll, uh, I'll need to be involved with this very quickly. It's completely unregulated and we have to be very careful here because what we'll find is some of our members might be approached by Tom, Dick and Harry saying, we'll pay you X pounds for your carbon credits, whatever those carbon credits might be. Uh, and that farmer does a sort of 10 year deal and then that's them gone for 10 years. Um, we believe there's big potential here because the whole carbon sequestration piece, it is for real. There's huge amounts of work to be done on it yet. Um, and on the back of that, we think that there will be carbon credits, which farmers will be able to sell. Um, if, you go, if you go down below carbon credits, I'm saying muck and ass, an asset, not a headache. Again, there is a chance that muck will be exported off farms to central biogas plants we're seeing this in the us um we're seeing it in other, in other parts of the world the problem with with cow muck um, as a digest um you know as a, um, as a feedstock for these digesters is on its own it's no good it's already been digested once it has to be mixed with something else um so the farmer in theory could have money for his milk he could have money for his carbon he could have money for his muck, but that will be a very, very small, small amount. I mean, it may be, you know, it may be negative or 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 zero, but at least it, you know, he hasn't got the um, and the cost of storing it. He'll he'll get the digestate back, which will have all the nutrients in it. Um, and and I think I think you know you know kids like Ed have got this juggling act. You know, I mean, my advice to him will be: look, you've got to keep the cows for twenty years because the cows are profitable. You know, the cows will make you money. If in if in 15, 20 years time, you're making more money by selling carbon credits and growing X, Y, and Z, the Germans tell me that if you plant sugar beans, now I've never heard of sugar beans and it might just be some sort of a wind up. They say that is the best carbon sequestration crop after a rainforest. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. I've never heard of sugar beans, but let's just say that was semi-true or there was a crop which could be planted and it was a great carbon sequester and it paid to have your carbon credits taken off by Microsoft or by British Airways or whoever, you know, you're going to look at it. And, and, all, and all these things will come into play. And moving to the left-hand side where we sort of, you know, about methane and CO2, I'm saying the science will win here. And this is exactly what Colin was saying. At the moment, methane, nitrous oxide and carbon, they're all lumped together. And in theory, methane's 32 times um, worse in terms of greenhouse gas effects than carbon but methane only stays up there for about 30 years whereas carbon from burning fossil fuel stays up there for thousands and thousands of years so how can it be 30 times 32 times worse if it's only up there you know for a fraction of the time that carbon from fossil fuels is and the science will win the science will win on this one it will win on the carbon sequestration piece then we get to the whole issue and it, in and you may have heard of this as a product called biochar. This is a long way off where you actually burn um, timber or, um, or green material in a, in, a, in a controlled environment. They use the heat and the power for the burning process to sort of you know, run motors and sell it as energy. The end product's biochar, which is carbon that's locked up for thousands of years. You can actually buy it in the garden center today and it's a soil conditioner. 
So you put the carbon back in the ground in a stable condition where it where it's where, where you know you know where it's locked up for thousands of years. Sounds too good to be true. It probably is, but it's certainly again something that you know is being looked at and, and may potentially be the solution. Just going on one more slide. Um, and I'm just going to finish now, just you know, just with a, with, a, with a few more um, positives. Um, and I think I think you know, this is this is back to milk and dairy. You know, the population is growing. You know, there are middle classes, and I'm not saying in Europe, in the population in Europe is not growing. But if you go into Africa and Southeast Asia, and the population, you know, is really growing. People are now becoming more middle class. They can afford more products. And certainly from an Arla perspective, dairy products in these parts of the world are in huge, huge demand. Certainly West Africa, Nigeria, they'll have 400 million, they'll have 400 million people by, I think, 2050. Um, I mean, you've heard on the GDT this, this week that um, you know, the, in, in the markets are up again. It's currently Chinese New Year. The Chinese don't normally buy in the holiday period. They're buying huge chunks of dairy products. And the reason is, the analysts are saying, is they believe dairy is good to fight off COVID. So these people, despite the vegans in the West, they can't get enough of milk and dairy. And the population is growing, the middle classes are growing. And I think also to mention that the population globally is aging. And as I said before, with the nutritionists and, and, their, and their clients in New York, as you get older, you need quality protein in your diet. That, that, that is a proven fact. Um, in Ireland, we had a talk a few months ago, sorry, last year. Um, they're saying that if you're born today, there's a 50% chance that you're going to live until you're 103 because the population is aging and life expectancy is growing probably by about 10 years every generation. Um, if you're born today, you're likely to know your great great grandchildren. Older people, need quality protein and there's going to be one hell of a lot of older people on the planet in japan the most aged population in the world there's, there's more nappies sold to over 70 year olds than there is to under five years old and that and that trend is continuing so there will be huge demand um, for milk and dairy and just to sort of finish on that um, um, all, um all the foods again has got a subsidiary called all the foods ingredients and we have a very very good a good technique of getting proteins out of milk and whey. There's about 250 proteins in milk. Not all of them have been isolated. There's one that's been isolated recently that has been proven to improve brain growth in children, in babies. Um, and of course, there is one manufacturer of baby foods who puts that additional protein in his product and sells it accordingly. They've also isolated one recently that slows the aging process. And there's more proteins that haven't even been isolated yet with all, all sorts of wonderful, um, um, you know, and things that it can do in a diet. So, so, you know, milk and dairy, it will still be there. It's, you know, it is growing. And, and for my son, Ed, it, you, know, you know, I think, you know, there's huge potential in milk and dairy if that's what he wants to do. I didn't, men I didn't mention genomics. Um, I think in terms of genomics, the one thing that is missing and genetics, the one thing that is missing um, is, is feed conversion rates in cows. Nobody's got a grip on it. There's lots of work going on. You could have two cows, both giving 8,000 litres. One eats 20% less grub than the other one. Well, the one that's got 20% less grub is far more energy efficient, profitable, and far less carbon and methane. And yet we don't know which one it is. So there will be huge gains um, in genomics and genetics um, going forward, as well as vaccines. There's already vaccines now for mastitis. Who knows? Vaccines for digital dermatitis, vaccines for fowls. You know, all this technology is coming through the system, make life an, an awful lot easier. And if you couple that with all these, all, you know, all these health monitors that you can now put on cows, it means that it'll be much easier to manage cows than uh, you know, the old fashioned herdsman spotting the sick cow in, uh, in cubicles. I've rattled on, I've gone over time, which for which I apologize. And if we just go on to the final slide, huge, huge amounts of unknowns. You know, the dairy markets, they will go up and they will go down. And the weather, it will be good and it will be bad. Uh, and who knows what's around the corner. So the roller coaster will never come to end. That makes it quite exciting. 
you know, for me, the day after tomorrow is, I think, going to be quite a great place to be. Thank you. Arthur, thank you very much for a comprehensive, not only background to your farm, but a good look into the future. Uh, I have quite a few questions here, probably in the wider context of right. Just going back to the practicalities of the farm, you seem to have a dual type dairy cow, and I assume there's an aspect to the calf and the sale of the calf and a higher value calf, always from that system, from, from the bull calf side of things. Uh, go on ahead, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, uh, you know, and you're right. Um, so, my, yeah, my calf income is probably about one and a half to two p a litre, uh, I, I would say. Um, in in Arla, we've just introduced a policy from the 1st of January this year that no calf can be shot or euthanized under 56 um, days old. I mean, I don't shoot my calves because they, you know, they have quite a lot of value, but you know, there is a lot more farmers now using sex semen because you know, the black and white bull calf, particularly from the sort of Jersey cross, doesn't have much of a value. Um, so we are seeing quite a change actually in you know, in breeding policies and breeding patterns. But for me, certainly, you know, you know, it is an asset. I mean, I, I am using sex semen as well, even though my black and white bull calves have a value, but I'd rather have a Belgian blue out of my cow um, and all black and white females. Uh, so, it, it, you know, it does pay to use sex semen, you know, it, you know, you know and, and I've got pretty good you know, fertility as well, so. Okay. Um, first question from the audience, Neville Graham. I says, what is your view or indeed the R of you on completely confined systems versus grass-based milk production? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I think I think I think there's two aspects here. I think statistically, in terms of herd health and animal welfare, um, you know, there's no difference. In fact, you could you could you know you could sort of push the arguments and and actually say the how systems, you know, tend to be maybe slightly better in terms of animal welfare health um but there is i think a move in public conception away from it and we have to be very careful because we've got members who are fully housed systems and members that graze we're not knocking either system you know both systems work there's you know there's very healthy cows in both systems and and we think that both systems are perfectly acceptable and that's how it should be well, that, that probably relates down. I'm just going to jump down two questions here. Uh, there's a question here, anonymous, that uh, it's, it's, uh, I've lost it there. Hold on. It's, it's uh, yeah. You have been fortunate enough to have grown up uh, in an area of your, where you farm, where you've got quite a lot of land availability. Um, is land availability going to be a threat to your business? Obviously, with a grazing system or a grass-based system. Um. I don't, I don't think it is. And I'll be honest with you, you know, I mean, when Ed comes home, there isn't, there isn't many young guys or girls of his age coming into the industry. And I think there could be huge opportunities. I, I think there could be a lot of land. We've, we've, we've got a, um, one of our Arla members. He's just now taken on his, I think on his, I think he's on his eighth farm in about four years. And he tells me that he gets probably a request every week from somebody who says, will you come and farm a farm? Or I've got a farm here that I don't want to farm anymore. Or, you know, can we share farm? So he's inundated with requests. So, so, I, so I think there is huge potential for young people. Okay. Uh, the next question, Alan Hobbs, uh, what are your bull selection criteria for Holstein bulls that you use for crossbreeding in your herd? Um, good question. Um, number one is uh, fat and protein, uh, because um, you know, that's what I get paid on. Um, and number two, I think, is um, udders, because um, even though I'm choosing the best Monty udded bulls I can find, uh, I want to protect them. Um, and number three is fertility index, because again, I've, I've, I've bred that in with a cross breeding, and I don't want to lose it by the other breeds. Having said that, Charlie, I think I think the Holstein breed in itself has moved on, uh, and you know there's some people saying to me now actually you probably you know if you wanted to could do away with the crossbreeding you'd probably find enough choice uh, within the Holstein breed to meet your requirements going forward, and and that may be the case. Okay, um, next question. Uh, this is a bit controversial one. 
This is from a friend of mine, Andrew Crawford. <laughs> Maybe this is not the right question to ask. What gives you a better return on your farm, your, your farm or your on farm investments? Your off farm investments or your on farm investments? 100% the farm investments. I mean, you know, I, I mean, my investments are cows and machinery and, you know, and a few sheds, probably 25% return. No way can I get 25% return off farm. The difference is investments off farm, you hand the money over and there's no work involved. Fair enough. Uh, and, and you're in a situation, obviously, Arthur, where you don't own land. You haven't got a big investment in land at the minute. It's, it's all machinery, cows and buildings, obviously. Yeah. Okay, right. Next question, John Martin. In relation to carbon credits, is it not more likely that farms will require their sequestration to offset their own production to meet net zero targets? Well, yeah, I mean, I know. I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, Arla, um, Arla has got a target as you know, as as New Zealand Fonterra to be carbon neutral by 2050. Um, so Arla and the farmers are all as one, if you like. So um, if 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 the farmer takes the credits, then all has got to offset um, you know, their carbon somewhere else. But 83% of the carbon cost of producing a litre of milk comes from farm. So, you know, Arla and factories, the same with Fonterra, they can do all the, you know, all the light with packaging, with logistics, with factories. The farm is where the majority of the carbon cost is. And that's why there's such huge focus on, on getting carbon cost down on farm. And it's it isn't easy, as I said earlier on, and the technology hasn't even been invented yet, I don't think, to get us down to zero, but that's where we'll end up. Okay, okay. I think this is the last question, um, Arthur, uh, from Greg Somerville. What did you change about your staff management after your Nuffield scholarship trip, and will that need to change again with a new generation with different outlooks on life, as you mentioned? Yeah. yeah. Um, I. I didn't change too much, if truth be known. Um, you know, I um, you know, I had some good lads, um, and um, what I'm you know, what I'm finding with with staff now is that is that there is some good, keen young lads out there who who are really up for it, um, but the really experienced, qualified herdsmen who spot the problems before they happen are very hard to come by. And that's what I was saying before that, you know, into the future, you know, the whole use of, um, of vaccines and activity monitors and all these other other means of keeping cows healthy will become more important because, you know, the experienced guys just aren't going to be there in the future would be my view. Um, okay, and that was a similar theme in New Zealand, you know, skilled labour seems to be becoming a problem right across the board, as it is in Northern Ireland as our herds get bigger. Uh, yeah, a couple yeah. more questions that come on there. We'll, we'll do a couple more and we'll probably wrap it up there, Arthur. The, f the first one, do you think that Arla would accept the return on investment that farmers have to operate at? How do we get equality along the supply chain? I'm not sure what way that's aimed. Uh, yeah, well, well, I mean, Arla, Arla is, a, um, is a farmer and cooperative and it's on this planet for one reason and one reason alone, and that is to return the, you know, the highest possible milk back to the member for, for milk price. What I would say is that statistically the dairy companies that invest the most money tend to pay the highest milk price so there's a correlation between investments in milk and processing um, and, and milk price and a, a lot of people can't get their heads around that um, but it's a fact yeah yeah, yeah. okay uh, i think uh, there's another one coming maybe two more here i will let that go uh, arthur from Alan Hops, your pregnancy rate is 28%. Do you know the breakdown there of conception rate and sex semen and heat detection rate? And are you using heat detection aids? I, I talked to you about this earlier, Arthur. Yeah, yeah I am. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm currently using heat time uh, and I'm just about actually to move on to their, um, their updated system. I'm a, I'm a little bit behind the curve because um, it's quite old technology now, the rumination colors. Uh, I've just got the activity monitors. So I am, I am moving on. Uh, well, I'm just about to order a set actually. Um, the sex semen actually, I'm finding the fertility, the conception on sex semen is actually exactly the same as, as conventional. And um, 
I guess like a lot of other people, I tried sex semen when it first came out and stopped, but now I'm using it on pretty much everything uh, and I'm seeing, you know, no difference. And fertility index, you know, conception rates sort of tend to be 40, 45%. Um, our heat detection rates sort of maybe about 65, 70, 75%. You know, it varies from time in time of year. Yeah. Okay. L last question of the night: uh, What is your average land rental charge? I know that makes it for a bit of a cost. Uh, I'm not going to. I'm not going to disclose that per acre. Not, okay. I'm not going. I'm not going to share that with you. That's fair enough. That's fair enough. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Fair enough. It's high enough. Right. It's high enough. Right. Okay, Arthur. Thanks a lot. Uh, three questions. Uh, I'm going to wrap things up with a few thanks here, Arthur. Thank you very much for a comprehensive look at your farm and the future of dairying. Uh, so uh, I want to thank both speakers tonight for their time taken to prepare and deliver two very informative and inspiring and thought provoking papers looking at the future and planning for the future and what's to come. Both have addressed the theme of this conference extremely well and to show how they have changed their and adapted their farming businesses based on their long-term plans to survive in a changing business environment. So firstly, we had Colin Glass, who gave us a very detailed insight into New Zealand dairy farming, which is also facing similar environmental and food traceability standards as, as ourselves. The presentation reinforced the need for us all to really focus on the new challenges of carbon emissions and improving water quality. Uh, then with Arthur, uh, and again, we looked at his farm, and he, he saw the future, he saw the need to adapt his business to survive. He identified the current and future challenges facing his business, particularly changing his dairy system to meet the demand of good success in planning and to produce milk to meet consumer requirement. His open-minded approach through attention to detail in the area of technical efficiency, prudent financial management and marketing, marketing have undoubtedly led to the de development of a very sustainable dairy business. So a big thank to, thanks to both of you. And normally you would applaud you for this. Unfortunately, in this meeting, we can't do that. So I'll give you a clap for that anyway. Now, I'm gonna move on here to a couple of other things. The last two nights have went well. It's been a, a new thing for the UJFs to do this. And special thanks must go to the general manager of Ag Research. He's been sitting in the driving seat here for two nights. Jason Rankin has helped to set up and manage this whole webinar technology. Without him, we've been lost for the last two nights. Um, big thank you to you, Jason, for that. In addition, uh, the quiet man, as I talk about, George Reid is the secretary of the society. He works uh, tirelessly to coordinate meetings and presentations, and undoubtedly this wouldn't have happened without him. He's, he's the guy in, in the engine room for the UGS and keeps it going year on year. And I don't think we realize how much he does for us. Uh, my co-host tonight, incoming president, Harold Johnson. Uh, as you're all aware, I was uh, co-opted on for a second year. And Harold will be taking over the chain of office uh, in the next year. Thank you, Harold, and for chairing the session with Colin in such a professional manner. Uh, most importantly, thanks to this audience from all over the world. I know that uh, uh, I saw Vicky Morrison in there from Canada, used to work with me from Caffrey. Harper's there. There's quite a few people in New Zealand there. Uh, thanks for this audience for taking the time to attend this event, albeit virtually. And uh, I'm very pleased the way it was went. Thank you very much again and to all the attendees. Thank you, folks. Uh, we'll sign off for there. Thank you.